Welcome to another presentation in the series in the history of uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our topic this time is Adventism beyond the borders of the United States of America between 1868 and 1885. It is understood and believed, it's commonly known globally, when uh, in some circles, even in some countries, and almost all countries, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is known as an American church. Obviously, that's without a reason. The reason is because uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the founders, the pioneers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church were all residing in the United States of America at that time. And for the first decades since its inception after the disappointment of 1844, the pioneers pretty much stayed within the borders of the United States. However, as it would be a movement of this kind, which has its basis on scripture with the mandate, go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations was bound to start growing. And that is what we find. As you will see on this map, if we were to think of uh, where the Seventh-day Adventist Church began first, it's really in the United States of America. The rest of the world did not have anything such as the Adventist Church. Obviously, keep in mind that uh, Christianity had spread to the rest of the world, but at this time, the time we are looking at, up until about the, the up, up until the period we are looking at, uh, the Adventist message was limited to North America. It would be helpful to have the context in which Adventist message found itself when it was organized and what uh, hindered it from being spread outside of North America. You may want to remember that uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was uh, legally organized in 1860. And in um, 1863, they had their first general conference. But just watch this or see this. 1860, when the denomination was organized. That was just one year before the beginning, the beginning of the American Civil War, which began in 1861. And then in 1863, when the Seventh-day Adventist Church organized its first general conference, this was really just in the middle of the Civil War, which had begun in 1861, and was and ended in 1865. Most Americans at that time were engaged in the war to the extent that very few paid attention to the preaching going around. As you will see in the next slide, the Civil War engaged pretty much two sections of the United States, and it was Soldiers were being recruited, people were being sent for war, and there was not much that the SDA faith could gain uh, in form of uh, growth. 
Obviously, Adventism began in the eastern part of the United States and began its spread by going to the western side of the United States after Civil War. Now, the spread of slavery in the United States, as you would see, the Civil War was much a war between the, the blue part here and this orange part here. The orange part believed in that they could not exist without the slave labor. And so to them, slaves were a part of their system. The Northerners did not, and this created the war. It was this war that hindered the fast uh, growing of the Advent message. As you would see at that time in the 1845, 1846, 1848, 49, going this side, there was very little activity this side of the United States besides the Seventh-day Adventist Church is organized just here. And so it's organized in the, in the middle and in the heat of the Civil War. The US as a country is divided into four regions. There is the Eastern part, the Central part, the Mountain part, and the Western part. As I intimated much earlier, Adventism began in this part of North America. It began in the part of North America, this region here, Maine, New York. This is where Millerites had begun. This is where the whites and all the early pioneers of the Adventist church were. Spread into Michigan, but it was still here. The growth that we will now see as Adventists began going beyond this point, will now jump over and come over to the Western side of the United States. Keep in mind, this is one country, but it's such a large country, it has all these time zones uh, in the same country. And it's fairly far from here to here. In those days, it could take months for them to get this side of the country. The Adventist spread to the West. In 1859, M.G. Kellogg arrived in California. He had come from the Eastern side, encouraged by those who listened to his sermons when he arrived in California, especially on the Sabbath doctrine, Kellogg began public lectures. And these lectures resulted in the formation of a Sabbath school in a home. So just take note of the humble beginning. 1859, Kellogg goes to California. He shares the Sabbath doctrine. Several people believe they form a Sabbath school in a home. In 1865, this little Sabbath school company began collecting money and managed to collect and send $133 to Battle Creek, which is in the east, to pay for the traveling cost of a minister to come and labor in California. Now, that is mission. Again, mission has always uh, uh, ridden on the back of dollars. And when there was funds to sponsor, they requested, can you send a minister to come to California? And at the General Conference of 1868, Elder J.N. Loughborough and D.T. Bodie were sent to California. And when they got to California, that was now the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist message going west. Keep in mind, California is in the west. And by 1872, both Ellen and James White arrived in, arrived in California and started a print, printing press in 1874. And as was the case up in the East, when they began work, they used a lot uh, of uh, printed pages to spread the message. So when they got to California, the Whites began a printing press, which enhanced the spreading of the gospel. 
It would be interesting to note that at the time when the, gen when the whites arrived in California, which was 1872, at that time, the General Conference president was Elder George I. Butler, who's, who was General Conference president from 1871 to 1874, and again later, and ended his uh, presidency in 1888 at the Minneapolis General Conference. This man was the first to reveal the secret of rap rapid expansion. And to this man, we credit the expansion of the church with regards to mobilizing ministers. He believed every minister was to evangelize new fields. Now, this concept was in direct opposition to the concept that local pastors should just pastor the place where they are. He believed local pastors should not be bogged down into local church pastoring. For is the work of the law, for that is the work of a local church elder. Meaning he advocated for pastors should be opening with evangelism in new fields. When they organize a church, hand it over to the church elders to continue uh, nurturing that church. With this principle, pastors or ministers became evangelists. This is the history why even in as late as um, 1980s here in Zambia, pastors were being uh, referred to as evangelists because they were supposed to go and conduct evangelistic campaigns. Numerical spread at that time, Adventists in uh, 1863 was at 3,500 members. As a result of the efforts engaged in ministry by 1888, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is just within a period of less than, or just about 25 years. Within this time, the church had grown to 26,112 members. At that time, this was tremendous growth. Factors for growth. I guess here we address what can we identify as the key factors that from a historical point of view, we would attribute the growth of the church the, or the Adventist church at that time. Number one, ministers were evangelists and not pastors. Again, I had elaborated on this point. Ministers were not encouraged or expected to be bogged down with pastoral work at a local church. Number two, lay members were organized into evangelists. The work of growing the church was historically in the hands of the lay people. Lay people using their own funds, using their own time, would go out and start new work in newer territories. Number three, literature through the printing and its distribution. Starting with the Millerites, the production of literature or evangelistic material on printed literature and its distribution has always been fundamental in its me method or methodological as an approach to church growth. Women were engaged in ministry, especially as literature and social workers. This involved the distribution of literature and the attending to social work. Women in the Seventh-day Adventist church have had a role they have played in making the church grow. At that time, as is indicated, it was in literature, distribution, and social works. Obviously, literature evangelists. When the printed pages were printed, they needed a man or a woman to take this. George King, born 1847, died 1806, was one of the most successful cow potters of that time. Number six, city evangelism and camp meetings. 
City evangelism and camp meetings were done by going into a large city such as New York, a large city such as Kim, a large city where they would go and pitch a camp meeting tent and then start preaching. In 1868, the General Conference organized its first official camp meeting. These camp meetings were attended by many people and they became a means of fortifying people in the doctrinal beliefs. Obviously, Sabbath school as a means for indoctrination of believers in Adventism was and has continued to be a method of growing the church. Lastly, growth of institutions, that's medical, educational, and publishing. Keep in mind, wherever the Seventh-day Adventist church went, whether it expanded in this case into the north or into the, the western part of the United States, one of the things they immediately did getting there was to start medical work, was to start educational institution, was to start public institution. These institutions when established become the key pillars or rather the key institutions in deepening Adventism among the believers. As you would see on this map, within the United States, institutions of higher learning are spread across, starting from Washington Adventist University in the East, all the way to Pacific Union College, Loma Linda University, La Sierra University, Walla Walla University, Union College, Southwestern Adventist University, Oakwood University, Adventist University of Health Sciences, and Andrews University. This is within one country. When this, and these are only educational institutions, there are publishing institutions, there are medical institutions all over. This has always been a part of why and how the Seventh-day Adventist Church grows. There is need to mention of the ministry of Maria Huntley. Maria Huntley served under the presidency of uh, Haskell, who was a conference president. And uh, during that time, a missionary society was formed and it was a, a brainchild of uh, Elder Haskell. And this organization, when it was formed, was engaged in the distribution of literature, attending to social work, counseling women. And this woman, Maria Huntley, goes in history, born in 1847, died in 1890. Maria was elected president of the Vigilant Missionary Society in South Lancaster during the 1870s. The main objective was to organize and direct women in distributing literature among foreign language groups. As I said, the idea was uh, a brainchild of uh, Elder Haskell. And this woman was a talented woman whose works go in history as a great person who served as president of the Vigilant Missionary Society. I must mention that attempts to include women in ministry go as way back as 1881. During that time, wives of two of our Adventist leaders, the wife, one was Sarah, married to Elder Lindsay, the other one was Ellen, married to Elder Lynn, were accompanying their husbands in preaching. After accompanying them, these women began to preach themselves. They preached in New York, in Pennsylvania, in Indiana, in Virginia, in Tennessee, together with their husbands. In New York, Sarah Lindsay spoke 23 times, a context that created many believers to believe that women could help spread the Advent message. She was a powerful speaker, one who stood by the side of the husband and spoke the oracles of God. As a result of evidence of how God was using women, at the general conference session in 1881, that is 1881, 
just about 20 years from the time the general conference was organized, a delegate at a general conference actually proposed that females possessing the necessary qualifications be set aside by ordination to the work of the Christian ministry. The matter was referred to the general conference executive committee where it was never heard about again. It died right there. But the point here is, you know, from as early as 1881, attempts have been made by believers from evidence of how they've seen women engaged in ministry to bring women to the level of being preachers, ordained preachers in the gospel ministry. To this day, this battle goes on and women remain unordained, at least at a global official level. So now you can see the Seventh-day Adventist Church by 2004, that which was a church that began just in this little part of North America has now spread into the entire continent of America. It has its, again, highest concentration as of 2004 in South America. This is Brasilia, Brazil. It has very, very high concentration in India, in the Philippines and the Indonesia, and obviously in the Eastern part of Africa where Zambia, Angola, Congo, Tanzania, Kenya are some of the highest concentration or have the highest concentration of Adventism, including some in the Russian territory, Australia and South Africa and the rest of South America. This is how far the Advent message has now spread from that historical humble beginning. Today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is organized globally under different institutions. This is South American Division. This is the Inter-American Division. This is North American Division. This is the Trans-European Division, Inter-European Inter Division, the Middle East and North East Africa, North Africa, then the West Central Africa, the Eastern Central Africa, Southern all over, now the Seventh-day Adventist Church is global. Obviously, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has pretty much followed where Christianity goes. Adventists have brought mainly into the Adventist faith people from other Christian faiths, such as the Catholic Church and all the Protestant churches. But then a time came when missionaries began going outside of the United States of America. Hence the subject of our topic today, which is Adventism outside of the borders of North America. History records the following as key leaders in taking Adventism outside of North America to the rest of the world as identified here. Elder M.B. Zekowiski went to Italy and Switzerland in 1864, and he went on his own as a self-sponsored lay person who went and began Adventist work in Italy and Switzerland and introduced that part of Europe to Adventism as early as 1864. J.N. Andrew in, was sent to Europe and Switzerland by the General Conference. Elder Andrew was the first and the officially sent missionary outside of North America by the General Conference, sponsored by the church. When he went to Switzerland, the other J.N. Andrew with his children began learning language, the local language of French, mastered it, began translating local material, began a printing work there, and began spreading the good news. That was as early as 1874. J.C. Matterson went 
uh, to Denmark and Norway under the sponsorship of the General Conference in 1877 and introduced in Denmark and in Norway Adventism. Again, all the methods were taken there, including institutions began and including printing began. William Ann and Love Barrow went to England and they went on their own, even though they were official church leaders, but they went and began work in England in as early as 1880. Hannah Moore and Dixon Alexander went to Australia. Actually, Hannah Moore was a lady who lived in West Africa and she was a Sabbath keeper. She met and shared with Dixon Alexander the Sabbath message and Dixon Alexander took literature with him to Australia where he actually began spreading Adventism. And then S. N. Haskell and J. O. Collis went to Australia in 1884-1885 and continued evangelizing the Adventist message to the Australians. These are some of the key people who were critical in formulating the what we would call our church growth methodologies. Elder J. N. Loughborough, a great, great person and leader in his own right. Ellen White, J. N. Andrew, George Butler, Uriah Smith, Stephen Haskell, James White, M. B. Chekowiski. These are some of the leaders who actually, under whose leadership or who themselves went out into the mission field. Ellen White at one point went to Australia and lived in Australia and witnessed in Australia for quite some time. We already spoke of Elder Andrew having gone to Europe as the first missionary sent there. What would be our reflections on this topic at this time? Three things. Seventh-day Adventist church today do not have to invent new methods of how to keep the growth of the church if they can only remember what has worked in the past. Some methods stand the test of time. There is no question even today that if you print the truth, you put it on printed pages, if you mobilize the lay people to be the evangelists, if you involve women in ministry and the spreading of the gospel, if you establish institutions around, if you follow those things that have worked in history, that there will be growth. Sometimes we want to try new things and that is okay. But fundamentally, we have identified things that have made the church to grow. Number two, the issue of engaging women in ministry is an old one. Since 1881, GC session, it keeps on surfacing over and over again. Even as late as 2015 General Conference in San Antonio, this issue came up. It doesn't seem to go. It probably will not go until women are ordained. I don't know, but history says this issue began in 1881 at a general conference. It has not gone, it's still with us. Lastly, institutions that's educational publishing and medical are the backbone of every denomination. They establish the roots deeper than just the gospel by itself. What this means is, when a denomination starts educational institution, publishing work, medical work, their reputation and spread will be deeper and deeper than if they did not have these institutions. And this is what makes the history of the Adventist church a unique one in terms of its growth. As you look at the beauty of how God has led the Adventist church in the past, 
If you've enjoyed this presentation and you've learned something and you'd like to continue learning, please do not forget at the end of this to, to enter and subscribe to this YouTube channel so that you would receive the latest production that I continue to make. Thank you.